Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, floats. So the float is a somewhat unusual tool used in woodworking, kind of like a file. It's used in a number of applications where you want dead, flat, really nice surfaces. Could be used uh, especially in plane making to make the little slot that a plane blade fits into on a, a traditionally made wooden uh, plane, but they can be used in all kinds of applications like mortise and tenons and uh, you know there's some applications for knife makers too. I always enjoy making my own tools, especially tools that are a little bit off the beaten path that are a little harder to find. So let's go ahead and jump right in and make ourselves a float. I'll be making my float from 1095 high carbon steel. If you want to do a similar project however, I'd recommend using O1 steel, which can be purchased in precision ground form, meaning it's been ground extremely flat, from industrial supply houses like McMaster Carr and Granger and lots of other places. Floats can take an extremely wide variety of forms, including some which almost resemble wide kerf saws, but this is going to be a wider one, more like a file. The basic idea of a float is that they allow you to finish very true surfaces and tight square corners in relatively precise woodworking situations including the throats of wooden planes, hence the name of this tool, as well as mortises, tenons, and so on. The planes I've made have been Japanese style, which have very thick plane irons, so a quarter inch float like this will pass through their throats but for thinner western style planes, you'd want to go with a thinner stock, say an eighth or three sixteenths. If you plan to use it for sizable mortises and tenons, however, the thicker design that we do here will be a bit more robust. The basic idea of the float is that it has triangular teeth which run across the entire face of the float. The teeth in this case are set at an 80 degree angle. I'll be cutting them in on my mill, but you could do the same thing that I'm doing by hand using a file. Take a lot of elbow grease, but it can be done. First, I'll need to reposition the head 10 degrees off axis. Next, I'll use machinist parallels to set up the steel blank, verifying the evenness of the surface with an indicator. The setup needs to be pretty accurate here because the teeth are only cut 25 thousandths deep. I use Fusion 360 to lay out plans for the float, calculating all the depths. I touch off with the corner of the end mill. Naturally, once it's all set up, I realize I put it in backwards, meaning I was about to cut the teeth so you could only use them on the pull stroke. So, I have to redo the entire setup. Once that's all fixed, I use my DRO to drop the 3 8 inch carbide cutter to the right depth. The cut is made in one pass, then the cutter is advanced 150 thousandths on the X, and the next cut is made. The key to this operation is that the trailing edge of the cut is used to form the triangular tooth that has to mate exactly with the preceding tooth. If you don't get that junction exactly right, you won't have a sharp edge and the tooth won't cut well. In fact, in a perfect world, I would use, say, a 10 or 12 degree dovetail cutter so that the tooth had a slight undercut. A single cutter like that would probably set me back several hundred dollars, so we'll stick with the $30 end mill. We'll find out at the end whether this is a problem or not.
And there we are, the hard part's all done. Incidentally, copies of the plan are available on my Patreon page to all Patreon subscribers. Click the link in the card for details if you want to work directly from a copy of the plans. Next, I'll lay out the tang with layout fluid. Then grind it on the belt grinder. The float is now ready for heat treating. Now heat treating is necessary in bringing the steel for all cutting tools to its maximum hardness. You can't just machine it and leave it. In this case I'll be using a blacksmith forge to heat it. If you want to try something similar at home though, you can just use an acetylene torch or even a backyard charcoal grill. I've got a video on how that would work. Click the link for details. Before heat treating, I'll paint on some homebrew anti-scale compound. There are commercial products like PVC that accomplish this same goal, preventing steel from developing a layer of oxides which would present some difficulties in cleaning up the cutting surfaces of the float. But I came up with a recipe of my own for fun. Now, I mentioned earlier that I would recommend most people use O1 steel, a common oil hardening steel which is much easier to heat treat than 1095. I've been heat treating 1095 for decades, so I know the nuances of it, but O1 is much, much easier. Basically, you just need to heat it up as I'm doing here, then quench it by plunging it in oil. Almost any oil will do. I'm using peanut oil here. I'll heat the steel until it turns a bright red. Now, you may notice that I keep tapping it with a small magnet. Magnets stop attracting to steel at about 1425 degrees Fahrenheit. We're aiming for around 1500, so a few passes through the fire after the float's gone non-magnetic, and I'm ready to quench the blade. In this case, because I'm using 1095, I do a quick quench in water to get the outer layer of the steel below the nose of the hardening curve, then transfer the blade immediately to oil to complete the quench. Notice I didn't quench the tang. That's so it'll remain soft and shock resistant. I'll test it with a file to make sure that it hardened and then transfer it to an oven at 400 degrees. Traditionally, I think floats are generally tempered at around 550 or 600 Fahrenheit so that they can be sharpened with files. But with the ready availability of diamond files these days, that seems kind of pointless to me. The edge holding of a tool steel tempered to 400, like I'm doing here, will be substantially higher. I'm not one of those guys who thinks you get sent to a higher level of heaven if you spent half your life sharpening the snot out of things. If you can do something else, why in the world would you squander precious moments of life sharpening something? The point of sharp tools is not sharp tools, it's so you can make better stuff. Anyway, I'll get off the soapbox. After a little cleanup, we're ready to install it in a handle. Of course, you could use a store-bought handle, but while we're on the subject of squandering large swaths of your life's precious moments, the whole point of this video is to show exactly how you can do that, making stuff that you could buy at Walmart for $9, or maybe at Rockler for $111.95. So anyway, I'm installing it in a homemade handle. This one is made from Zeracote wood, which just saying it is easily worth $111.95, so if you do this, you pretty much get your money back right on the spot. Zero Cote. Zero Cote. Zero Cote. I'll be putting out a video in a couple days where I'll show how to make handles like this that can be used for files, rasps, chisels, and so on. 
I did, if I may say so, a real crap job of sizing the hole of the handle to the tang of the float, but it'll work. Poor craftsmanship can always be remedied by liberal applications of epoxy, and if that fails, there's always duct tape. Seriously though, you can also buy little rubber inserts for commercial handles that are more accurately formed to fit standard tapered tang shapes. Just drill the hole, stick the little rubber thing in there, and then the float should fit pretty snugly. And we cross the finish line. See, here's a fake tenon that I'm pretending to use this on. It really does a great job of flattening the wood, cuts pretty well, and most importantly, it's great at really squaring up those corners. So, all self-deprecating hilarity aside, the thing actually works great. I mentioned earlier that the rake of the tooth was at least potentially a problem, but nope, all good, it cuts perfectly. Thanks for watching guys. If you feel like you got something out of this video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, click on the link to Patreon for a great way to give back to the channel. Plus, check me out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Links in the description. If you want something sharp and pointy, maybe a gift for yourself or one of the cooler people in your life, check out my Tactics Armory website and pick up one of our tactical or outdoor knives. And finally, if you want to learn to make hamons or Japanese swords, check out waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find videos about how I make hamons as well as forging, mounting, polishing, and fittings for Japanese swords. Thanks and see you soon!